Welcome to the biggest and busiest railway station in the northeast. Dating back to 1850 and Grade 1 listed, this is a significant calling point on the East Coast mainline between two of the UK's capitals and the gateway to one of England's major city regions. But you aren't watching this video to listen to the intro to a Wikipedia article. No, we're here to find the proper trivia, all the oddities and hidden details you might walk right past on a daily basis and never notice. This is Secrets of Newcastle Central Station. Approaching the station from the streets of the city centre, the first thing you see is the striking arched portico, providing a suitably grand entrance for travellers. This wasn't how it was originally intended to look, however. The original architect for the station, John Dobson, whose fingerprints are all over Newcastle, initially planned a much larger and more ornate facade for the station. But this was paired back greatly by his replacement, Thomas Prosser, at the behest of the North Eastern Railway, giving us what we have today. By all accounts, Dobson wasn't happy. At the end of the 1970s, during tunnelling beneath the station in the construction of the Tyne and Weir metro system, the works caused part of the portico to shift and gaps to open, and so the entire eastern corner of the structure had to be carefully dismantled and each individual stone numbered before being reconstructed once the metro station below had been built. In 2014, the portico was redeveloped, glazing in the arches to create a new concourse for cafes and ticket machines. Before this, it had been open to traffic, and had acted for many years as the station's taxi rank. I remember it as a dim, loud and fume-filled space that I was always happy to get out of as quickly as possible, so the new light and modern space presents a marked difference indeed. Now we come into the main concourse of the station itself. And just above the passageway from the portico, you can see three carved portraits in bas-relief. These are Queen Victoria and her husband Prince Albert, who officially inaugurated the station on the 29th of August, 1850, when they passed through by train. Added later in the middle is the head of their son, King Edward VII, who in 1906 opened his eponymous railway bridge across the River Tyne. This bridge proved revolutionary for Central Station, as it meant that through trains travelling to Edinburgh or London no longer needed to reverse back out of the station in order to continue their journey. And just above Edward you might spot another head, but this one's not royalty. This is Mercury, or Hermes, classical god of travellers and communication. Sporting his winged helmet, he's here to watch over all the rail passengers passing through the station. Next, let's pop into the Centurion Bar, which is set in the stunning first-class passenger waiting and refreshment room built in 1893 by the Northeastern Railway. If you want a drink in style like a wealthy Victorian while you wait for your train, there's no better spot. When you enter the metro from the station itself, you're greeted by a striking artwork above the escalator. Titled From the Rivers to the Sea and created in 2004 by printmaker Hilary Painter, these gorgeous wood engravings celebrate the local landscape and the legacy of famous Newcastle engraver Thomas Buick. But they didn't used to be here. Up until 2017, the panels were located on and between the metro platforms, and were recited when the station was refurbished to provide a welcome to travellers entering from above. A little way down the main station concourse, you can find a memorial plaque commemorating the tragic Great Heck rail disaster, when a GNER intercity train having departed from Newcastle on the 28th of February 2001 struck a vehicle that had crashed onto the line near Selby in North Yorkshire before being hit by an oncoming freight train, killing 10 people, including three Newcastle-based staff members who are remembered on this plaque. If you would like to learn more about the crash, I would recommend the in-depth documentary made by fellow creator Disaster Breakdown, for which I'll add the link to the video description. Now let's nip into the toilets. The gents' toilets, located just past the ticket offices, were refurbished by LNER after many years of lying derelict and originally date back to the 1890s. The refurbishment returned them to their historical splendour, if you can really say that about toilets, 
and they're definitely worth a look if you need to go. Just next to here we find Platform 12, the current highest numbered one in the station. But as of May 2023, this bay platform is now disused to allow for the adjacent Platform 11 to be lengthened. And the rail tracks have even been physically disconnected from the rest of the lines. Okay, I've been putting it off, but I think it's finally time to talk about that roof. You can't help but notice the giant graceful curve of the entire train shed, and this big bend was necessitated by the track layout and the station's location, needing to give incoming trains a safe shallow curve on their way in. At the time of construction in the 1840s, the roof was built with the innovative new technique of using curved girders of wrought iron to create the ribs of the arching shape. Newcastle was in fact jointly the first station in the world to do it, along with Liverpool Lime Street's own shed roof, which is a lovely fact that twins these two great railway cathedrals together. If you even glance towards the eastern side of the station, you'll probably spot the city's namesake. That's right, the station architecture even accounts for sightlines of the historic Castle Keep. In fact, before the days of heritage preservation, the railway was unceremoniously punched right through the old castle grounds, and trains still pass right by the stone walls of the fortress to this day. And the castle keep is actually the perfect place to take a look at the station's next secret. Viewed from the east, you can see where the tracks cross over and diverge, with one line heading northeast towards Berwick and Edinburgh, and the other turning south to cross the high level bridge. But back in the day, this crossing was a whole lot bigger, and a whole lot more complicated. So much so that it was made famous as the world's largest railway crossing, and something of an attraction in its own right. Comparing how it used to look to today, you can quickly see the main reason it shrunk so much. A bunch of platforms have disappeared. Yes, where the car park is now sited used to be a set of bay platforms under an extended glass canopy built in the 1890s. These were used by local suburban trains, and even had their own separate concourse and booking area. But when the Tyne and Weir Metro took over the local routes from its underground platforms, these platforms became obsolete, and the whole station was reconfigured to increase the number of through services that were able to operate. You can still see signs of the car park's past life if you cross under the station along Orchard Street and look up. Also at the eastern end of the station, you might spot these odd-looking structures beneath the station canopy. I had assumed that these were old signal boxes, but in fact they're the old parcel lifts which offloaded mail items destined for the city from postal trains. In fact, there is still an underground tunnel leading straight from the lifts to the Royal Mail Sorting Centre next to the station. If you head to the very western end of Platform 8, you'll find the next secret, an old and disused water tower once used to refill the boilers of steam trains as they made their stop-offs. The base of the tower used to hold offices, and the plaque on the side tells us that it was built by the Northeastern Railway in 1891. And finally, we get to my new favourite thing at Newcastle Central. On Platform 5, if you look up, you'll spot on either side of the tracks that there are sections of stonework which are a different colour to the rest. This is because these bits are much newer because right here used to be the station's main signal box, bridging over the tracks above what used to be Platform 10 and the old parcel sidings. You can sort of see why this area used to be nicknamed The Hole, as it must have been unpleasant, particularly when filled with diesel fumes. I wonder what those people would have made of Sunderland Station today. The signal box was removed and new platforms installed around the turn of the millennium, and to fill the gap, new columns were put in to match the pattern along the rest of the platform. But despite being visually indistinguishable, since they aren't structurally holding up the roof, these replacement columns are actually hollow inside. And you can confirm that by knocking on them. Thanks to Jamie for pointing this brilliant detail out to me. And those are all the secrets of Newcastle Central Station I could find. Which one's your favourite? I really hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to see more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to make sure you see the next one. Thanks for watching.